Despite having discovered along the lines of 5,000 exoplanets since the search for them began, we actually know comparatively little about terrestrial ones like our inner solar system planets. We know of exoplanet gas giants, hot Jupiters, probably ice giants like Uranus and Neptune, and other giant planets because they are simply easier to detect than small ones. As a result, we know comparatively little about terrestrial rocky worlds, but we do know about some. A good example is the TRAPPIST-1 system, where you have an ultra-cool red dwarf star, a very small one, only about 9% the mass of the Sun. This star system is much older than our solar system, coming in at about 7.6 billion years old. But this is not particularly surprising, as red dwarf stars are much longer lived than our G-type Sun. Located only about 40 light years away, this type of target in the search for rocky exoplanets was favored in being relatively nearby, and planets were found around it. In fact, in this system alone, seven terrestrial planets were eventually found, all orbiting close in to the star in a complicated orbital resonance, a situation that very well may have existed since the formation of the system. This is a double-edged sword because the tidal forces on these worlds could make at least some of them intensely volcanic from flexing, much like how Jupiter's moon Io maintains its volcanism through being flexed by the giant planet. These planets are also probably tidally locked, all presenting one face towards the star. Some of these planets orbit within the habitable zone of the Trappist star, and as such could host liquid water along with a volcanism. That's tantalizing for two reasons. First, when Earth had those conditions, which it still does, though to a lesser degree than the early days, that's when abiogenesis occurred on this planet. Second, with the recent linkage between volcanic basaltic glasses and the genesis of RNA, a proposition that now seems experimentally confirmed, incidentally, a show dedicated to that coming on my Event Horizon channel very soon, and a link to the associated paper in the description below, then any world with volcanism and water comes on the table as ideal to at least start forming complex RNA molecules, the starting point for abiogenesis and the RNA world model. But we don't know that much about the TRAPPIST-1 worlds beyond that. What could shut them down, for example, is if the planets in the habitable zone do not have atmospheres. This is a particular problem in that they orbit so close to a red dwarf that it could have stripped their atmospheres off early on if they had them. Though new models of red dwarf dynamics seem to show that their flares tend to concentrate nearer to the star's poles, meaning that the planets would generally be spared the intense flares associated with some red dwarfs. Another issue is that the densities of the planets in the system are known, and they are low, which may be an issue as well. As an aside, really tiny stars like TRAPPIST-1 straddled the distinction between a red dwarf star and a brown dwarf object. Given how cool their photospheres are, they can actually have clouds in the form of dust and condensates. But this may not be the case for this particular star. There is some evidence of dust, but that it's distributed evenly all over the star, meaning that in a way the star's photosphere is hazy. Interesting things happen with very small stars. But the TRAPPIST-1 planets aside, we do know of two terrestrial planets that are associated with water and volcanism, Earth and Mars. Venus may also enter the fray here with further study of its geologic history. But just the idea that our star system hosted two worlds that had simultaneous volcanism and liquid water bodes well for the conditions of abiogenesis. If you have two chances for it in the same star system, then that suggests that these types of worlds are common in the universe. But there is a wild card here, and that's water. While water is an excellent solvent for the chemistry of life, and it's very abundant in the universe, at least in its frozen form, it can also be somewhat of an issue in that too much of it may prevent abiogenesis at all if it interferes with the production of RNA. Too little water and life does not happen. Too much water and it may also not happen. Only in situations where you have ample water, volcanic geology, but also dry land does it seem likely, at this point, that our model of life could arise. Of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't other pathways, such as environments like Enceladus and Europa and their hydrothermal vents. Thankfully, again our star system produced two planets that had volcanism, water, and dry land, again Earth and Mars. But that creates a somewhat big question. If you have a terrestrial world that has too much water, in other words a global ocean, 
And if life managed to get a foothold on such a world, either through abiogenesis or panspermia, and then undergo Darwinian evolution and reach complexity and intelligence, then could it develop a technological civilization advanced enough to show a technosignature, such as a radio signal? The answer in a nutshell is probably not. We don't really know how common global ocean exoplanets are. We haven't even definitively seen one yet. But if they are very common, along with locked-in ice shell oceans, then the universe could be teeming with life, even intelligent life, but most of it is hopelessly aquatic. Mastering technology in an oceanic environment is a problem. Intelligence in an aquatic environment, on the other hand, does seem to happen. Octopi and some of the squid can be very intelligent. Though the lack of land would preclude situations like Earth, where much of Earth's intelligent ocean life descends from land mammals that adapted to go back into the oceans. So at least hypothetically, increasing intelligence may evolve on an ocean world if there is pressure for it to happen. If some situation regarding predators, for example, or some factor that favors increasing intelligence, or even just enough time, could trigger the occurrence. On Earth, for example, after 4.5 billion years, we have a group of highly intelligent hominids, Homo sapiens, and our immediate but now extinct relatives, like Homo erectus, but also a group of up-and-comers, species like chimpanzees, gorillas, cats, dogs, some of the birds, and so on, that also have some level of intelligence, and with the right evolutionary paths, they may someday become technological species themselves. That could mean that the older the world, the more likely it is to have intelligence. So planets like the TRAPPIST-1 system that are billions of years older than our solar system may have an abundance of intelligent life of varying degrees. But if it's more often than not on an aquatic planet, then that may prevent most technology, both because of the environment, but also physiology. Life adapted to operate in water is probably going to lead to convergent evolution. This is where very distantly related species, or entirely alien ones on an exoplanet, tend to develop similar features because those features work best in water. The shark and the dolphin come to mind here. They both have fins, but for very different evolutionary reasons. They share a similar body shape and means of locomotion through water. Why? Because it works. And evolution naturally fills those niches, leading to two very similar appearing creatures but with very different evolutionary histories. Because of this, you might expect certain aquatic species bioforms to be very common in the universe. You might go to an exoplanet with an ocean and see something that vaguely resembles a shark, for example, or an octopus. But what you don't see animals in oceans doing is harnessing fire. And that's somewhat of a showstopper, because to build a civilization, the first thing you need to do is learn how to make tools, which is very difficult to do with fins, and then harness fire, which is impossible underwater. The one wonders if underwater volcanoes might offer a rather imperfect option for a replacement. This leads to a scenario where ocean worlds exist that have no land, therefore no matter how intelligent the species present on it might get, they can't ever escape the confines of the water. If this scenario reflects the bulk of Earth-like exoplanets, then the solution to the Fermi paradox is that the universe simply has too much water for intelligent life to be common. The ultimate in irony, really, in that which allows for life, also tends to prevent technology. But the scenario may not be all that likely given the aforementioned fact that our own solar system has Earth and Mars. And it's also worth noting that volcanism tends to like to build dry land, see the Hawaiian Islands. And this leads to some interesting strangeness about our solar system. The tallest mountains in the solar system tend to be volcanic in nature. This is certainly true for Earth. While Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on land, the highest point on Earth at 29,032 feet, it's beat by the volcano seamount Mauna Kea, which from its base rises 33,500 feet. Yet Mars sports the truly astonishing volcano Olympus Mons. And despite Mars being smaller than Earth, this volcano dwarfs anything on this planet. It comes in at about 25 kilometers in height, or about 80,000 feet, and its footprint is comparable in size to the state of Arizona. And recent evidence shows that parts of it are geologically young, meaning that this sleeping giant may be active and could erupt again in the future. Ultimately, gravity plays a part in the sizes of these mountains, as does weathering. And while Mount Everest does continue to grow, it can't do it forever. And most estimates place it at probably the upper limit for Earth, though this is debated. And Everest isn't a volcano. Rather, it's caused by a collision of two continental plates. 
a situation that's unique to Earth in this star system. Likewise, Mars with its lower gravity was able to produce a bigger volcano, so much so that it clears most of the atmosphere and can usually be seen peeking through during Mars's periodic global dust storms, and it probably can't have produced much bigger. While a situation like Mount Everest requires continental drift and impact, giant volcanoes do offer a path for dry land on otherwise entirely oceanic worlds and any volcanic dry land could, in principle, allow for the formation of RNA. Past the formation of RNA, however, we enter the land of a biogenesis mystery again. RNA is a molecule, but it is one that can store information. But how that becomes life itself is still a mystery, as is how DNA comes about from the chemistry of RNA. But the fact remains, it did happen here and the recent finding about RNA really favors Mars strongly as a candidate for at least former microbial life. What this means for exoplanets is largely unknown, other than if the process is straightforward, then it favors them. Given that volcanism appears to be a component for life, the oceanic world solution doesn't seem like it would happen enough to account for the great silence. At the same time though, it might bear the implication that worlds with too much water simply never form life or worlds with no volcanism. The ice shell moons might be similarly devoid of life, for lack of the conditions needed to form RNA to get the process going. That in itself is a solution to the Fermi paradox. The universe simply has too much water. But it does lead to an interesting scenario. If you had a world with only a few volcanic archipelagos on it representing all dry land, or worse, a single island, as in Arthur C. Clarke's novel The Songs of Distant Earth, for fun let's call these Thalassa worlds in homage, you could have a very unpleasant situation that could prevent civilization on its own. Not enough resources for any land life there to get very far, or ever sustain a large enough population to move forward, or presents conditions so harsh that all time is spent on survival, and intelligence is simply never turned towards the invention of technology. I can't help but to find this one a rather sad solution to the Fermi Paradox. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about contact with aquatic alien intelligences without knowing they were once aquatic. Imagine interacting with an alien at a banquet. Everything's going swimmingly, until the chef brings out a plate of calamari, and the alien just looks at you and says, What have you done? An awkward and unsettling first contact indeed, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.